Our last speaker for today is Madam Afra Nadia Marizan. She obtained her degree from UHM in 2007 and she is now at Sunambolo Hospital and she works in various departments. She is a very enthusiastic farmer. She is currently in charge of pet services and MTEC secretary at the Hospital Sunambolo, Ministry of Health. And for your information, she has five years experience, working experience in OPEC and two years work experience in MTEC psychiatry. Without further ado, the floor is yours. So I call Madam Afra to talk on this OPEC opening possibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manasna. Um, I am very much um, um, happy with this opportunity given to me. Um, okay, so uh, I am not very sure about uh, how much everybody knows about uh, OPAD. Um, I have received some feedback um, about, about, I mean, about uh, the um, uh, what what actually OPAD is about. So um, here goes. All right. Okay. So the topic for uh, my presentation today is uh, opening up possibility. Right. So basically, um, the, the the short form uh, is OPAD, and the abbreviation is outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy. So what it means is that it's actually uh, in in a simple term, it's a, it's about giving. It's a system. Where you give um, intravenous infusion uh, of antibiotics in an outpatient setting, All right? So in this case, uh, you can see that uh, the patient does not have to be admitted in the hospital, or they might be discharged earlier before uh, the patient um, actually completes their uh, antibiotic course. All right. Okay. This is just a short, a brief history about OPAD. It actually started way back in 1974. It was uh, described. Um, uh, in the U.S. Um, for the treatment of cystic fibrosis in children. As we know, the treatment is, um, it takes a long time. I mean, it takes a few weeks. Uh, you know, the child will be on the treatment for a few weeks. You know, so what they did was that they, they, they set up a, a system, a service whereby they allow these children to go home with an infusion pump with the antibiotics. All right? So, and since then onwards, you know, um, a lot of other countries around Europe, um, uh, Canada, um, and even uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, you know, the recent one was Singapore in 2006. And we, we started much later, 2016. All right. And along the way, you can see that um, IDSA have published uh, published um, guidelines on OPAD, and even um, UK has also come up with their own um uh, consensus or, or, or uh, guidelines, all right? Okay, so what about OPAD in Asia? So as of until 2016, um, there were only uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore uh, who have actually, who have that comprehensive service, okay? So um, from this, from the journals, we know that um, these services, these comprehensive OPAD programs are not common in Asia. Uh, if there are some sort of service, they are not structured. They are not um, structured as how they define OPAD. And we know that uh, the problem lies because there's no continuity uh, of medical and nursing staff. And um, there's no um, outcomes uh, in terms of, uh, sorry, there's no outcome registry in, terms, uh, in a way that they do not, um, when they discharge a patient, uh, send them for uh, antibiotic infusion in a clinic. They do not um, record what was the outcome for that patient. And and it's, and and the last point is no specialist input into the uh, antibiotic prescription. All right. So why is um, why do why do we say that OPAD is opening up possibility first? The service itself is comprehensive and systematized. Okay. It should be patient centric and holistic. You know, whereby whatever service that you provide um, in the inpatient, you should be able to provide, you know, when the patient is under the uh, OPAD services, all right? And um, because of that, you know, we, um, OPAD should, uh, the service should be able to make adjustments 
you know, in order to uh, provide optimal care for the patient, right? Uh, all uh, all upper, um, factors um, considered, you know, the primary illness, the comorbidities, if patients come in with infection and they have underlying uh, diabetes, you know, that, um, and whether there's emerging, emerging issues, with, uh, including both medical and social complications, you know, sometimes we do have patients who does not have a, um, family support, you know, okay. So um, the second point is, this is very important, OPAD has been, um, um, is known to be safe and clinically effective, right? However, it should conform to the OPAD practice guideline. Um, and, you know, under this guideline, you will have, uh, there are requirements where you have, you need to have a team, there must be a practice guideline, there must be a patient selection criteria, um, you know, there must be um, a, a list of things that you can do and you cannot do, and how are you going to monitor your patients and things like that, all right? Third is the advancement of drug development and um, medical uh, technologies. Okay, first we know that, um, you know, now we, we have um, uh, once daily dosing antibiotics, and then um, I don't know if, um, if all of you are aware that there's um, devices uh, we call elastomeric infuser. You know, uh, it's almost similar to the infusion pump, but it uh, it does not use any uh, mechanical. Um, uh, it does not use any battery or anything. It runs on its own. I'll show you all later about it. Okay, so these uh, modern devices actually helped into um, uh, the advancement, uh, the need of this service actually. All right. So third, um, OPEC has been reported to be cost effective. Um, Reported in Singapore, Canada, uh, and uh, I've just quoted three countries in the UK. You know, uh, all of all of these countries reported that uh, the uh, OPEC has actually um, uh, cost-effective uh, effect on um, the uh, treatment of patients. All right. Okay. So generally, the advantages of OPEC is that we allow patients uh, to go home earlier. We discharge patients earlier. Say, for example, if patient requires uh, six weeks of antibiotics, if um, normally after three weeks, um, if patient is stable, you know, uh, we can, we usually allow patient to go home under the service and patient will come back um, every day um, for follow up with us, okay? And then, it, you know, because uh, when you allow patient to go home earlier, then it means that they have shorter hospital stay, it lowers the risk for hospital acquired infection. And normally these patients, when they go home earlier, you know, they will come back more relaxed and they are more happy. Uh, this improves um, quality of life. And at the same time, when we discharge patients earlier, we ease the demands of uh, inpatient resources. You know, uh, in some major hospitals, we understand that, um, you know, patients have been put in waiting in the uh, emergency uh, department because, um, because you know, they, they can't get into the wards. And also, um, with uh, the service that uh, we can actually allow some patients to go home, uh, I mean, to come, uh, go back to work or school earlier, right? So this is just a summary report of uh, the effectiveness of OPEC uh, for various infection conditions. Uh, you can see that um, this is reported in the IDSA OPEC guideline. Um, there's a whole list of uh, infection that has been treated and a whole lot, long list of uh, antibiotics, all right? Okay, so just before we go on to, I mean, sharing hospital Singapore's experience, I just want to share um, the, the important elements of OPEC, okay? First, we should understand that it, it is not a pharmacy-based service. It is not a, uh, um, I mean, the doctors shouldn't be running the service on their own, and neither the nurses. So it's an interdisciplinary team of professionals who are committed you know, in providing uh, quality care, quality patient care, and it should be as effective as in patient care, as, as I mentioned earlier, all right? And um, we know that OPEC services, there's no one size fits all. It should be customized following to the needs of your service, all right? Um, I mean, to the needs of your facility, if you have the resources or if you have the location and things like that, okay? Um, um, this service must conform to a certain guideline. If uh, normally we would, um, the, the, the facility should have their own OPEC guideline, right? Because this guideline will actually help uh, the team 
on or the professionals, the healthcare professionals to oversee the the, the service itself, right? So tak I mean, we don't go off 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 off, off track, you know, in our treatment, in our uh, uh, in providing service to our patients, right? And then there's uh, considered various um, um, uh, various patient features, uh, the catheter, what sort of um, infusion catheter issues. Um, uh, what, how do we monitor, uh, I mean, what sort of things to monitor, and then whether or not, um, when we run the OPAC services, you know, we must conform to, and to, to the AMS, um, component as well. You know, um, I, I understand that sometimes, um, we, we're so short of beds that we need to discharge a patient, and, you know, we can't, we do not have an alternative for, I mean, uh, uh, for example, uh, MSSA bacteremia, for example, you know, a patient can go off with uh, Fifazolin for two weeks. But, um, you know, just because sometimes we really need a bed, so, you know, the next step is to escalate, to change the therapy, not escalate, to change the therapy to ceftriaxone. So that is some, some issues that needs to be um, 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 taken into consideration. Uh, we can't just, you know, um, start everyone on ceftriaxone just to eat. Convenient, yeah. All right. So again, I mentioned it should conform to the standard OPEC guideline. Um, the, um, the common ones is the IDSA and the good practice recommendations by UK. And then I've also, uh, I would like to mention about this OPEC care bundle because I think um, in terms of uh, running the service, I mean, what happened on the ground, uh, this OPEC care bundle um, is, is, is actually very good. Okay, so um, okay, so this is just uh, uh, an overview of the key elements of OPEC. Uh, you know, there's too many things to highlight, but just so that if you feel like you want to read, and you can actually um, have a look later. Okay, so what are the steps to implement OPEC? This is uh, I have actually received um, various many calls from other hospitals um, about how. How we started our services in hospitals in Abulo. So um, the first question I will ask is, what is your intention for OPEC? The intention has to be clear. What are what is the actual problem that we want to address? Okay, whether the wards are overcrowded, or because you know you're too bored to see a patient staying in a hospital for three uh, for six weeks, for example. So that has to be addressed first. Why? Why do we need the service? And then what? Um, what do you want when you have OPEC services? For example, you just want them to go off to complete the antibiotics. Or if a patient presents in the emergency with uh, for symptoms of pneumonia, with, um, so are you going to start a treatment and you know discharge a patient with OPEC while on uh, acute illness? You know, okay. So and then the second one is the model, whether the it's going to be an infusion clinic. Infusion clinic means um, we have a, a clinic in the hospital and patient will come to the clinic every day until uh, the patient completes uh, the course, the antibiotic course. Or there's home OPAD, there's community OPAD, there's so many terms. So these are the models that the um, that we need to think of if we want to start, if we want to start implementing OPAD. Okay, what, and, and also what is the care approach? Is it going to be a single department um, uh, approach or is it going to be a multidisciplinary like for example, in Hospital Singapore, we uh, it's only limited to the medical department. So maybe you know, in a different hospital, they want to uh, team up with um, the orthopedic. So those are the things that need uh, to be uh, thought of before actually starting uh, with that. And then the most important one is also resources. You know, if you have a team, uh, it's the best is always to have a, a, an ID physician, ID consultant, but uh, if in some uh, hospital that uh, does not have um, ID consultant or physician, any medical um, consultant or specialist who has the um, who wants who has the passion to run the service, I mean, of course, the uh, the OPEC, I mean, the service can happen. Okay, and then. There's also, um, you need a trained nurse, a trained nurse, uh, a trained infusion nurse, you know, who knows how to check the, uh, lines. And then there's a pharmacist. 
uh, pharmacist, there's a lot of uh, some some guidelines says you need a clinical pharmacist. Some guidelines says you need uh, to have a trained pharmacist. Some gu guidelines says you need to have um, this pharmacist should be um, infusion um, expert pharmacist. So it depends on uh, who is that pharmacist. I mean, anyone, any pharmacist who has that passion or who has a drive to do it, I'm sure you can do, you can do it. Okay. And then second is we ha um, whether uh, we have access to other healthcare professionals. Um, because um, monitoring, laboratory monitoring, everything has to be done in the clinic. Um, and we have to make sure that everything is in place. We can't just run a clinic uh, without not having, you know, other people to, to, to help to support the service. Okay. And the next is uh, the antimicrobial selection and delivery method. Okay. As we know, um, the one daily dosing antibiotics, they're easy. Tetrazone, etapenem, easy. You know, we just, uh, the pharmacy will just apply to the clinic and a patient will come every day for, you know, short infusion, I mean, maybe an hour or two hours infusion and then they can go off. But what about uh, antibiotics that are uh, multiple dosing? You know, example, cefazolin or example, um, ceftriaxone, I mean, uh, ceftazidine, you know, so those are the things that we, um, the team has to actually think about. I mean, if you have the resources to actually buy the infu um, the, the infuser, uh, then it will be bonus, but if not, uh, what are the alternatives and uh, what are the methods that we can do? And then the, 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 the last point for resources is, of course, uh, drug monitoring and other laboratory monitoring. Okay. And uh, the service, uh, open service guidelines, as I, said, as I mentioned earlier, yes, it's very important. You have to have written policies and procedures. This is uh, from our reading and also from our own experience, okay, because it will clearly spell out roles and responsibilities, uh, before we uh, uh, recruit our patients, you know, we have to uh, provide uh, information, consent, you know, and and we have to give them education materials, and also there must be a, a guideline for outcome monitoring. What what monitoring? What outcome monitoring are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And that's very important. Okay, so these are the the main steps when we want to implement our uh, OPEC. Right, so this is the care bundle. I really like it because, um, because actually, whenever we have a referral, these are among the things. These are the key aspects that I will actually um, go through. That with the team, we will go through all of this. Okay, patient family education, um, whether the patient can go off, uh, whether the, the the family can support um, the patient being under the service. Um, you know, and then when the patient goes to OPEC, whether the primary team will actually review the patient again, you know, and then uh, what are the things that we need to do when the patient is under OPEC and things like that. So it's very good. All right. So I'm just I'm just putting up here the roles and responsibilities of the doctors. You know, the doctors will receive, perform, decide, review patient and things like that. The nurses, they will do all the, the administrative, the, the administration, um, provide patient and caregiver education, you know, but my actual um, um, focus here is about, uh, is on the response the rules and responsibility of OPEC pharmacies. Okay, it is uh, quoted uh, in, by the uh, UK uh, OPEC team that um, the input from the team pharmacies is of great importance for this service. So the idea is to A, if you can see that uh, you, you can see that they mentioned about acquisition, storage, compounding, dispensing, all the normal things. And but the AASHP, they mentioned about uh, pharmacies um, to conduct a pre-admission assessment and educate patients about the antimicrobial agent and possible side effects. Okay, and 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 in the UK, the service has gone advanced in a in a way that um, the pharmacies has already started prescribing antibiotics for uh, OPEC, okay? So, but that's still a long way to go. Okay, so um, this is just uh, an overview of the rules and responsibility of our pharmacies that I, we have put in our guidelines, okay? So advice on infusor and less summary infusor care, uh, maintenance and disposal. Uh, yes, um, we assist with the procurement, uh, we collaborate with the nurses um, on the supplies of antibiotics. Um, 
we must make sure that the first dose of antibiotics is given in the hospital. And we give um, advice on a appropriate interval for TDM if there is any. Um, um, we, period, uh, we periodically monitor, the pharmacies will periodically periodically monitor the OPEC service storage with substitution and dispensing of antimicrobial and um, advice on infuser and uh, elastomeric pump care maintenance, sorry, that's a repeat. And last is to attend the meeting. Okay, so I, I hope you all get the picture about um, the service. It's not a one-man show. It's like you really, everyone has to take part in, in, in the service. Okay. So um, the next slides will be about um, sharing um, our experience in Hospital Singapore. Okay, so um, just a general overview. Uh, we are a 620-bedded uh, hospital. Um, currently, the medical department, we have five wards in the main building and four wards in the GKN. Unfortunately now, um, due to COVID, all these wards have been turned. I mean, the hospital has been turned to COVID hospital. Right, so... Uh, the issue is that um, patients have uh, to stay in hospital. Patients will have long hospital stay just to complete the antibiotic. Okay, uh, example, uh, patients who have intra-abdominal abscess, um, patients who develop as a, as a skin and soft tissue infection. These are patients who cannot go off uh, with just oral antibiotics. Okay, if there is an option for oral antibiotics, yes, they shall be discharged with oral antibiotics. But if the condition does not permit the patient to be on oral antibiotics, and the patient has to be on long duration um, IV antibiotics, so the patient should um, uh, be, uh, I mean, be suitable for OPEC. Okay, so why we we opted for this service is because we have a good location for OPEC. We have um, TPKM, you know, um, it's easy access and there's ample of parking, you know, well, uh, even though the main building is, is jam-packed. In TPKM, it's free and easy. So patients are free to move around, you know, and it's also very windy down there. Okay, so we... The, and the bonus is that we have um, the ID team, okay, and then we have the facility to support OPEC services. We have a clean room. We have a clean room to prepare, to help prepare all our uh, preparation. And then, of course, the financial support. This will come from the director of the hospital um, because, you know, purchasing, you know, um, the infuser, it's not, it's not very cheap. So if there is uh, some sort of financial support, of course, um, the service can take off, okay? So in our um, center, in, in Hospital Singapore, we, uh, the open model is uh, we run an infusion clinic. And then, um, however, the, the service is only very lim it's only limited to medical department. Um, and we only allow patients who, who who are about to complete their antibiotics to be enrolled into the service. We do not take acute illness onto our, uh, onto our service. Okay, mm -hmm. so in terms of delivery method, there's two methods. First, the uh, IV infusion. And uh, second, we do have um, the elastomeric infusion. So it will run over 24 hours by a continuous infusion. Okay, okay, so this is how we started. Uh, started in 2015. And then, you know, um, the doctors were sent to train, to be trained in Singapore. And then we developed our, the committee, the policy group calls. And then we, um, uh, we obtained our location, um, and registration charge. Um, and then we set up the workflow for, for patient, uh, to be charged and supplies. And, and we, and the source, uh, we procure the, infuser and all the other preparations so we actually the first patient came in on february 2016 all right and along the way there's some hiccups so you know of course there must be some service improvement along the way right so the question mark there is how many safe bad days we've managed to achieve and how many patients have been enrolled into the service 
So this is our clinic. And that's the, 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 the earlier team. You know, my two nurses have gone. So we've got another nurses now. Um, and this is on the, the right most is um, our service guideline. Okay. So this is just uh, to show you what is the criteria, uh, criteria for OPEC. Um, you know, this has been, we've gone through this uh, a number of times. Um, um, of course, that special circumstances comes all the time, breastfeeding patients, patients with renal disease. Uh, we've not had any um, immunocompromised patients uh, and patients who have severe renal impairment. Okay, we do not uh, enroll patients who are under 12, uh, post op infection, patients have neutropenia and other um, morbidity requiring hospitalization, even if sometimes patients have been referred for OPEC, but they've not um, been able to sort out um, some comorbid issues like uh, diabetes, the patient's um, sugar has not been well controlled. So we will not enroll the patient yet until it's been sorted, okay? Or likelihood of non-compliance determined during screening. This is very, 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 very important. You know, um, when um, the patient might fit all the criteria clinically, but when we go and interview the patient or the family member, and we um, and and if there's some uh, issues that warrants us to not um, enrolling the patient into the service, that we will not. Okay, so I just want to show you the OPEC drug delivery method. Um, the IV pump we do not use it. Okay, it's been used in um, other countries, I'm sure. We have the elastomeric pump. Okay, that one is. Um, if you can see, it shrinks, but when um, the antibiotic is in it, it's going to be like a balloon, okay? So what happens is that it's going to run on its own and it will shrink back again, okay, over 24 hours, over a period of time. Uh, and the rate um, of infusion is constant, 5 mils per hour or 10 mils per hour, things like that. Okay, and then the infusion and that's the IV bolus, okay? Okay, so OPEC and HSB, uh, we have uh, treated these types of infection, um, intra-abdominal infection, bacteremia. These are the number of infections that we've come across under OPEC, UTI, um, skin and soft tissue. Um, in fact, we've got a few um, IE patients, infective endocarditis, uh, disseminated infection, and one case of osteomyelitis. And these are the normal, the, the antimicrobial agent that we've used and you know these are just the list of the organism that came with the infection right okay, so we've got uh, for the antibiotics we've got uh, cefazolin the common ones are uh, cefazolin, cefazolin, cefazolin and atapinin okay so um, this is our, our report in 2017 um, Okay, out of all the patients that have been enrolled until the end of 2017, 90% of, 90 of them completed um, uh, the service, uh, the, the, the service here. Yeah. Okay, only 10, but, uh, 9, almost 10% did not complete and they were being readmitted. And these are the reasons, I mean, these are, um, I mean, these are the reasons why they were readmitted. First, um, two patients developed line related complication. Uh, one developed disease-related complication, one developed um, antibiotic complication, and then for line-related complication, we've had one patient who had a dislodge, the ICC line, and then uh, one patient developed plaster reaction, which is quite bad. Um, it almost became a secondary infection, so we had to uh, remove the patient from the service, from the program. Okay, so I just want to show you um, until the end of 2019, we've had uh, 78 total enrollments, and we've saved 1,026 uh, bed days, okay? So uh, it may not be that much, but um, considering that um, uh, we, uh, it's only very limited to the medical department, so I guess uh, I think we did quite fine. Okay, uh, what about the cost effectiveness? Cost effectiveness, um, we do not have uh, an actual data on this, it should be, uh, we should be doing it soon, um, but um, it's safe to say that when a patient goes home, 
uh, on the um, once daily dosing antibiotics, it, uh, the cost would be uh, very much uh, less compared to if the patient were uh, to stay in, in, uh, in, in the hospital. However, if the patient is on the, uh, the infuser, the elastomer infuser, then um, I, um, I do not see uh, it's, it's too early to tell whether there will be some cost um, savings um, from there. Okay. All right. So is it all roses? No, it's definitely not. Um, we've had one case of sustizidium toxicity, uh, and then we've had another case of near miss uh, toxicity. And then along the way, we've um, enrolled the wrong patient, we've not properly identified the main caregiver, you know, and then when the patient comes uh, for their daily visit, we've missed our morning sign, you know, and um, we've also had patients who did not comply to the service. You know, um, we, um, the patient actually uh, drove a car and where we told him not to drive. And, and as a result, uh, the lines of the infuser got tangled and uh, his uh, PICC line got ripped off. So, yeah, and then he pushed it back in and then he came back with a uh, fever. Okay, and um, we've had issues, uh, technical issues with the infuser. And uh, the last point is that um, we sometimes do not get referrals. So that, that's quite a challenge, really. Uh, it's almost like, you know, uh, you're there, but your, your service is not, you feel that you're not moving. Okay, so I'd like to share this one case about um, our patient. It's a 43-year-old uh, Malay male with underlying diabetes and hypertension. He had meliodosis with liver abscess and resolving ATI upon referral to OFAT. So the fatigue clearance was 44 mils per minute, and then he was on self-diabetes children to the S. And especially the primary team uh, plan that uh, when the creatinine clearance improves above 48, then the patient should increase, uh, the septicidib should increase the sulfur to ID. So having uh, reviewed um, the kidney progress um, daily, uh, we suggested that um, the dose be maintained at sulfur to the S by a continuous infusion, uh, six grams over 24 hour trial. So if you remember, uh, the patients will have to stay in the ward for one day um, to try for trial. Uh, if everything goes well, then the patient will be discharged uh, under OPEC. So during the trial, the patient was given um, additional two grams. Okay, and the, 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 the patient claimed that the infusion completed within 18 hours. So um, when, we, when we heard, when we were told about it, uh, we were shocked. Uh, so we quickly asked the, the ward to repeat a serum um, 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 and we found that the creatinine clearance dropped from 44 to 33 mils per minute. Okay, so we were actually contemplating, um, you know, we thought that this patient might not be suitable for the service, but uh, after very much, after much discussion and deliberation, we feel that the patient should continue that as it in, uh, continuous infusion at six grams over 24 hours, and we will repeat um, uh, the kidney uh, RP monitoring for three days, and and we will observe the infuser uh, uh, the infuser uh, how long does it take for the infuser to complete? Okay, um, usually the infuser will run over 24 hours the fastest over 22 hours. So we've not had any case whereby an infuser runs over 18 hours and it's quite alarming. You know, there must be something not right. Uh, you know, the patient might have put it under the bed or under the uh, blanket or anything that, you know, it runs faster than, than usual. So, so in the end, we decided, yes, we will kick up this patient, we'll take it as a challenge, but these are the plans that we need to do. This is the plan that we need for this patient. So um, patient presented to the clinic the next uh, so the next day the patient was discharged and uh, eventually when he the, the next day that he came to the clinic the following day he claimed that the antibiotics completed way earlier so he was discharged at 10 p.m. in the morning 
And then the next day, he came to the clinic at 8. And then the next day, he called us to tell us that the infuser finished at about 6 in the morning. So we know that. The, I mean, and he's always early for his um, 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 clinic. Okay, so, and the other issue is that the infuser was replaced earlier than 24 hours. He's supposed to change every day at 10. But every day he will come at 8 and he will, uh, and the nurse will, will replace the infuser. Okay, and when we check his RP, um, of course, uh, it did not improve. Okay, so then we decided that um, there might be an issue with the infuser that we cannot, a technical um, um, problem with the infuser that we cannot um, uh, sort at, at that point of time. So we were quite lucky because we actually had two different brands. So we tried, we said, why don't we try the other brand? which we know is a, um, a lot more um, consistent um, and it's stable. I mean, it's for use, it's much easier to be used compared to this one. So we had the infuser changed and then we repeat, uh, we did a daily RP monitor for two days and then we can see that the setting clearance improved uh, to 53 meals per minute on day, um, you know, and as day goes by, you know, the final setting clearance was, 53.1. Okay, so it is important to know. So, what have we learned from this um, case is that first, when we come up with a case, when we have a case and we receive a case like this, you know, it's not something that is common. You know, uh, for milliard doses, uh, you know, the, generally, the uh, if according to guidelines, the dose uh, for uh, cefalazidine is usually higher. But we have to take into consideration about the kidney function. You know, patient has a um, resolving um, kidney injury, resolving AKI, you know. So all those have to be taken into consideration. And what about the use of MBG, uh for the uh, infuser? You know, I, I, to be honest, this is something very, very new um, for us because, you know, we have never used a... Um, a, a device that runs that administers the medication over 24 hours. Even if we have a continuous infusion in ICU, the patient is still there, is there in the ward to be monitored. But um, in in under this service, you know, the patient will only come back the next day. All right. So what about the pharmacodynamics and kinetics of these continuous infusion? So that has to be thought about. I mean, there must be, I mean, we have to go through, we have to go back into literature and journals and see what they say about this, whether we should dose a patient at 8 grams per day or we should uh, change the dose to 6 grams per day despite the improving kidney function. And what about the possible ADR? Um, you know, uh, are we, um, do we know that, um, uh, uh, do we know the um, side effects of, uh, of, of um, Cephalazidine if the patient has, um, uh, if the patient receives very high dose, you know. Okay, so those are the things that we need to know when, when, if we run a service like this, you can't just go blank and know, oh, um, uh, we're not sure, you know, it, it can't be like that because when a problem arises, when a problem like this comes, and then you'll be like, you, you cannot play guessing game, say, oh, it could be this or it could be that. That's, we have to be certain so that we can, you know, start the problem immediately. Okay. So what we've learned is first teamwork, um, effective communication. We understand that along the way uh, between the primary team and the OPEC team, there there was a breakdown of communication. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that the patient received an extra two grams in the ward. You know that should not have happened. Uh, it was written in the case notes, but um, um, uh, unfortunately they. Uh, they we, they didn't um, get back to us about it uh, and continue with their plan. So um, <laughs> we had to tell them, hey, look, you know, because of that program, this is what happened. Um, and then um, we have to um, remind each other again of, of, of our roles and responsibilities. Um, you know, you can't just rely, uh, put something on, on the nurse, or oh, this is your thing, you should do it. I think everyone, every member of the team, should know what is going on with every patient that we have enrolled, okay? And we have to carry the responsibility together, right? So 
what we did is that the second uh second thing is that we improve our work process. Um, we make sure every um time uh, a a special patient like this comes, we must come up with a very uh clear treatment plan. Okay, it has to be clearly defined who's going to do what, when, um, and and how, um, you know, so that we do not miss or you know things like this do not happen. Um, clinical monitoring, what is needed, what is uh, needed to be monitored, and then uh, and then we reviewed again our guideline. You know, we discussed again. Oh, whether we should you know include uh, these under special circumstances or what do we do when we have cases like this? Is it going to be a Case to case basis, or are we going to just do it, uh, you know, uh, like lock for and barrel, just like go ahead with it, you know? So those are, and then we actually we re, um reviewed our patient assessment, uh, and documentation. Okay, sometimes um what happens is that uh some recording is being uh, manually recorded, so when it's being manually recorded in an IT uh, hospital, so those record can go uh, unnoticed. Okay, so it's very important. So we've had that sorted. We make sure that everything is recorded online so that the the doctor, wherever the doctor reviews the patient, whether he's in the clinic or he's in, you know, the ward and he can actually see what is going on. And then patient education is also very important. In this case, the patient, uh, we say pandai pandai lah. Okay, uh, di pandai pandai sendiri. Uh, he actually removed the the uh, his uh, infuser at uh, six in the morning, you know, uh, and he because he knows that you can lock the he can lock the PICC, so he did it on his own, you know. Um, so we had to go through that over again, you know, with with patient, and we made sure that all other patients after him um, were being taught. Uh, thought um, um, in detail about uh, PICC care and things like that. Okay, and then this one last bit is very important: is update knowledge in its effect. Um, because it's not very common, even if it's uh, known in hospitals and below. But um, um, we do not have that many cases. We the most we're going to get is about three or four cases in a month. You know, we do not get any more beyond that. But um, so, you know, and, and some cases are very straightforward cases. So, you know, when a special case like this comes, you know, you, uh, some of us do not know what to do or what is need to be done. So that comes with training. So uh, we do, uh, we train ourselves. I mean, we have a discussion from time to time, you know, discussing back, looking back at some previous cases that we've had, just to make sure that whenever the next, uh, whenever, Cases like this comes the next time. At least we are uh, ready. Okay. So where are we now? Um, I wouldn't say that we are the treating center, but because we are the first in Malaysia to have the service, uh, we've also had guests uh, from H Star and Hospital Putrajaya, and now they have successfully um, run their own program. With um, I've heard they've got good results as well. So I'm we are very happy. Um, and um, the way forward is um, um, to look into the cost effectiveness of the service, um, whether in hospitals near below or in other hospitals or in Malaysia as a whole. And then um, I wish that we could get a drug stability de database. Um, because since we're using the um, electromagnetic infuser and it runs over 24 hours, so stability is of course of concern. And then um, the other one is to have a multidisciplinary multidiscipline um, OPAT services um, um, in a way that um, maybe the um, <laughs> so sorry. okay um, so have a multidiscipline OPAT services um, if we have a multidiscipline OPAT services um, an example we get um, the OPAT uh, orthopedics or surgical team to be part of the OPEC services. I think we're going to get uh, a lot more, more diverse uh, cases. Every, the number of cases will uh, definitely um, grow. And there's a, there's, I mean, 
I mean, it's going to be, I mean, for me, I think it's going to be a lot more fun to have a lot more cases that we can learn from and, and see how well we can manage. Okay. And, and the other thing is that, um, the plan, uh, is that, um, to have, uh, the, all the, the nurses to be credentialed, um, for line care and the pharmacies be credentialed for, um, antimicrobial Okay. Right. So, in summary, uh, we know that OPAT is safe is a safe and effective alternative to inpatient care. It is an attractive possibility for improving inpatient care. Um, it promotes. It should promote antimicrobial stewardship. And you know, it is a concept whereby when you have the right personnel and system, it can be applicable to the department. And the practical implementation of OPAC requires careful consideration of a number of clinical and organizational issues. Okay. So my last slide, I've I've got a question. Can OPAC services operate during this COVID nineteen pandemic? So with that I thank you.